how do I know, even if it's written early, that over the years it wasn't corrupted? The, the, the earliest documents are simply Jesus as a simple teacher, a simple Jewish rabbi, and then history turns him into a legend where all of a sudden he's the living son of God who rose from the dead. How do I know it hasn't changed over time? I've got uh, Michael Jackson there for a reason. Accuracy is important, and you gotta trust that the witness has not changed their story over time. In this particular trial where he was accused of molesting uh, this child, the key witness was the child's mother. And unfortunately, she had in the past tried to defraud J.C. Penney. When that came to light, that she might have tried to say a lie in the past to make money from J.C. Penney, they looked at that and they said, well, gosh, if she wins this case against Michael Jackson, she's surely gonna sue for it, so maybe she's doing the same thing here. So it is important to determine whether or not people have changed their story over the time. That's a part of what we do in, in uh, testing reliability of eyewitnesses. And I think that's fair. Have anybody ever said this to you? You can't trust the gospel writers because, man, they don't even agree with each other. These gospel writers are so ridiculous. How many angels are at the tomb? How many women ran to the tomb? How, what's it say over Jesus' cross? You got four versions. Not, not, no version matches any other version. If there's these kinds of contradictions, why should you trust any of the gospels? That's what I used to say for years until you start working cases and talking to witnesses. I had a case one time where I was about a little less than an hour away from the crime scene and it was rainy that night and we had a murder and the patrol officers were first to respond. They call out the homicide team. I had to get a suit on, put a suit on, get out to the scene. And now it's about 50 minutes behind the crime. And for those 50 minutes, not to let the witnesses get wet, they put all three witnesses in the back of a patrol car. And they sat together in the back of the patrol car by themselves for 50 minutes. Now, why are you laughing? Because you know that's a problem, right? Why is that a problem? Yeah, they're going to talk to each other. And they're, if nothing else, they're going to say, oh, really? I didn't think it happened that way. I thought, okay, maybe you're right. And so before long, I get one uniform story three times. That's not what I want. I want three beautifully messy, seemingly contradictory things that I have to work out because I'll figure out why they seem to be contradictory. That's my job. I'm going to figure out what, what perspective, physical perspective, emotional perspective, history perspective, what is it about this witness that causes them to see it a certain way? She's going to catch some details, but miss others completely. And you're going to think, how in the world could that have even happened that way? But this guy's going to catch the other details and together those puzzle is going to be a beautiful, robust story about what actually happened. But I need to have all the messy pieces in order to put the puzzle together. I don't want one piece that maybe I can't even trust. So just know this. When you're working cases like this and you have more than I, one eyewitness to any event, I used to do a thing with my youth group uh, where I would just have them in the group and I would have somebody come in and assault me and run out. I would ask them deep details about the assaulter, the assailant, and uh, nothing would ever match. Because this is always the case. Witnesses never, ever, ever, ever agree on every detail. That's okay. That's a good thing. We should praise God for that because if they agreed on every detail, what would you say? They're lying. They've colluded somehow to make the story up. So don't be surprised this is the case with the Gospels. Of course this is the case with the Gospels. You know, the earliest Christians could have erased those differences. <laughs> they didn't. Could have made it a lot easier for all of us, you know. It could have said, you know, a thousand years from now, someone's going to doubt this thing. Let's just change that one little detail. Didn't happen. Because that's what we do with eyewitness accounts. They are naturally messy. Now, let me ask you a question. How do I know that in the time between the life of Jesus and the council, somebody, though, didn't change a significant fact about Jesus? We have a similar problem when we do criminal cases. At the crime scene, and we eventually have to go to court. And sometimes it's 32 years, 33 years between that one thing and the other. I'll put a casing in the crime scene. See, I just put it there. I'll put the same casing in the court scene. There it is. See it? Bullet casing. How do I know that that casing at the crime scene is the same casing that's in the courtroom? How do I know that some lying detective didn't insert that in property 20 years after the fact? And because nobody knew any better, that thing got passed off to an unsuspecting criminalist who worked it like it was real evidence and gave it to another detective who didn't know any better and brought it into the courtroom. And now I've got a bad piece of evidence in the courtroom. It shouldn't even be there because it wasn't part of the original crime scene. How do I know? I think something similar could have happened in the, in the Christian story. How do I know that somebody didn't see something at the crime scene, but what we have in court is something different because along the way, 100 years after the fact, some lying author changed the details, and then there's some other unsuspecting Christian after that brought that tainted testimony into the council. A lot of skeptics would like us to believe this is true. 
Well, I know at the crime scene what I do. I go back and I look and I establish something called the chain of custody. I simply go back and I say, hey, do we have anybody who took a photograph of that casing at the crime scene? A Polaroid, by the way, that's what we used to use. Does anybody even know what a Polaroid is? Okay, good. How many of you remember doing this though? <laughs> that's a real Polaroid, okay? You have to actually take the little, the little dip the little thing. And remember that? You have to put the formula on it so it would develop. Boy, that's really going back. Okay, the point, though, is that's all we had sometimes with these Polaroids at the crime scene. But I'm looking for somebody who was at the scene of the crime, who took a picture of it, who then collected it, signed for it, turned it into property, who signed it into property, signed it back out to another detective, who signed it into the crime lab, who then investigated it, signed it back out to another detective, who signed it into court. That's called the chain of custody. Now, the question, of course, is, is there a similar kind of chain of custody for the New Testament? Is there somebody at the crime scene who took a Polaroid? And I can look at it and see what does it say about Jesus? Turns out there is. I'll give you an example of this. We'll start with the life of Jesus again. Here's the courtroom, Council of Laodicea. And here we have uh, the first uh, guy at the crime scene, John. Takes a Polaroid, but how do I know that it didn't get changed? Well, John gave this to the next officer, who happened to be his student. He had three students. Ignatius, Papias, and Polycarp, who all became leaders in their own right and wrote letters in which they describe what they were taught by John. So we now have a snapshot of what John says, not based on John's gospel, based on the writings of his students who became church leaders in their own right. Ignatius wrote seven letters that still survive. And in those letters, he's quoting all kinds of New Testament books, including John's gospel. We have a picture of Jesus just from Ignatius. Same thing happens with Papias, but his work is lost to us. He's quoted by Eusebius. I'm just going to let that go for now. Let's go to Polycarp. One letter survives, and we've got a picture of Jesus as given to him by John, and he quotes a lot of scripture, 14 to 16 books. That's a lot of, of New Testament. Don't think for a second that the New Testament was formed at the Council of Laodicea. The New Testament is already in existence. They're already quoting it. It's just formally recognized at Laodicea. Don't be fooled by this. It's already being quoted early in the second century. They have a student too. Both Ignatius and Polycarp had a student named Irenaeus who became a leader in the church and eventually identified what he called the reliable canon. And he identifies 24 books. And when he got to his student, Hippolytus, he reiterates what he's taught by Irenaeus. Unfortunately, Hippolytus was uh, not in favor with the Roman leadership, was exiled to the mines and died in the mines in Italy. And unfortunately has no student that I can locate to see what that student said. But I could do the same chain of custody with each writer. So if I'm looking at what Paul wrote, I've got a chain of custody through Linus and Clement, both mentioned by Paul in their letters, both early church bishops. Clement wrote a letter called First Clement. And I can keep on going down through all these students of Peter through Mark and the North African bishops all the way through Eusebius into the council. So I can follow and take a picture of Jesus along the way to see has he changed over time? Or is the Jesus we know the same Jesus that was described in the very earliest years? Here's what I find out. If I didn't have the writing of these three guys, Peter, John, and Paul, and all I had was the writing of their students, what would Jesus be look, what would he look like? He, unfortunately for Bart Ehrman and other skeptics, he'd be the same Jesus we know today, the miracle worker who called himself God who rose from the dead. That's the Jesus that skeptics hate. That's the Jesus they want you to believe has become a legend from the real Jesus who wasn't any of those things. But unfortunately, the earliest eyewitness accounts describe him this way. We're stuck with that. 